Right, so uh, today we are going to discuss on a few important topics, uh, which are not only relevant to DHS2 Tracker, but uh, this is, these concepts uh, you'll, you'll come across whenever you are customizing DHS2 in general for aggregate, as well as sometimes uh, when you are analyzing data, and uh, especially when uh, you as implementer support your DHS2 instances in the country, these topics are going to be very crucial. So they're going to be interesting uh, and as well, they're going to be sometimes complicated because uh, here you'll be, we'll be discussing about, uh, I mean, a uh, few of these minor, I mean, some complicated uh, concepts like the authorities. So uh, we will try as much as possible to make them clear to you during the presentation as well as uh, in the demo session. But if you have any queries, please uh, feel free to ask them in Slack. And also um, we request you to refer the DHS to documentation as usual. Right, so today we are going to discuss about uh, users, user roles, and user groups. Uh, the objectives of this session include uh, describing the individual concepts that make up a user, and then configure these concepts in a DHIS2 instance, and also how to create a user in DHIS2 incorporating all these concepts. So what actually um, um, constitute a user in DHIS2? So the first concept is we have something called user authorities. So what we mean by user authorities is a, is a permission to perform one or several specific tasks within DHIS2. And then uh, we have another concept called user role. So what is meant by user role is a group of authorities uh, created for a specific type of user. So we are going to discuss about each of these concepts in detail. So in this slide, we are kind of giving you a, a basic overview of different concepts. And then we also have another concept, which we have already come across when we were uh, sharing uh, our uh, design tracker program called user groups. So user groups is a, is a group of user that have access to a specific object in DHIS2. So there are so many objects, different types of objects in DHIS2. And to provide access to these objects, we use this concept called user groups. And then we have organization units. So, I mean, this term is something that you are really familiar with. We have been discussing about organization units from the DHS2 fundamentals. It is one of the uh, three dimensions in DHS2. So what do we mean by organization units? Uh, basically, organization unit controls the user access to administrative units in data entry or data analysis and search. And finally, we have users. So uh, all of us who are accessing DHS2 are DHS2 users. So a DHS2 user is an individual DHS2 account assigned to user roles, user groups, and organization units. So now let's uh, look at each of these concepts in a little bit more detail. Uh, user authorities. Now, DHS2 uses something called an authority to allow the users access to various components of the system. These authorities are very granular in nature. You will see when we are doing the demonstration and they control detailed operations of what can be done in DHS2. So it's basically like uh, we, will, we will show you what are the different authorities we have. We have a comprehensive list of authorities. So it's kind of limits, restricts, individual tasks a user can do within the broader DHIS2 system. A user authority can provide a default behavior when creating objects in the system. So we have like kind of two concepts under this, we are like public versus private. So what we mean by public objects, uh, like they can be seen by anyone who logs into the DHIS2 system. So if you create a DHIS2 public object, for example, uh, there are some metadata items we create as public in DHS2 system. For example, these uh, programs that you created are configured as public, which means it can be seen by anyone who logs into the DHS2 system. And at the meantime, we can also create private objects in DHS2. So the attributes that you uh, created, uh, for example, uh, when you are customizing up configured as private objects by default. Uh, that is how, how we have configured the DHS2 instance for this academy. So these private objects must be shared in order for others to see them because it is private to that particular user. So in, in any case, if you want 
these privately created objects to be shared by others, uh, you have to share it with the specific user. Okay. Right. And uh, now let us again discuss a bit more about different authorities which are there. So, for example, uh, you will see that we have authority called all. So, when we are using this, uh, when we grant this all authority in a DHS2 system, it grants authority to do everything in the system. So, for example, uh, whenever we grant this authority, usually this authority is granted to the super users. They can do anything. So, they have all permissions, unlimited permissions to do anything within a DHS2 instance. Then we have uh, uh, an authority called tracker capture application. So this, what it does is it allows the user to access the tracker capture app. So if we do not grant the authority to weave the tracker capture application, that particular user will not be able to see the tracker capture application in, this, in, in, in that uh, user's apps menu. It will be disabled. And we have, for example, authority called update tracked entities which allows a user to modify a tracked entity value after enrollment. And we have another one, which we will uh, show today called uncomplete events. So this allows the user to reopen a previously completed event. So if we complete the event to, uh, to make it incomplete, incomplete, we, are, we have to use this uh, particular authority. And then we also have authority for, for example, search, a track entity instances across all log units. So this allows the user to search beyond the organization units that they are assigned to. So generally we assign um, uh, some org unit to a particular user, but if this user has uh, access to weave across all log units, then that means like whenever he searches, he, he is able to search whoever who's registered in any of the org units in our DHIS2 system. Right, so what do we mean by user role? Now, previously we talked about authorities in DHIS2. So these are individual permissions. So basically what we mean, mean by user role is a collection of such authorities. So we, we discussed like, for example, in the previous slide, we mentioned five different authorities. So if they uh, kind of, uh, if, we, if we group them together, we can make something called uh, DHIS2 user role. So uh, authority is basically right to perform an action within DHIS2. As I mentioned before, it could be public or private, and it receives access to various apps and functionalities within DHIS2. And these user roles, which is a collection of authority once created, we can assign this user role to a uh, DHIS2 user, right? And once that user uh, is assigned a user role, he can log into he can log into DHIS2 instance, right? So basically, what we mean by DHIS2 users are are are, are particularly the people who log into DHS2 instance, okay? So I guess like DHS2 user is a very simple concept to understand because we all, uh, all of us here are, are users of the DHS2 instance that we are logging in to customize, right? But when we log in, all of us will have different user roles. Right. So here we are kind of uh, explaining further the concept of user role. So as you can see, he, see here, uh, we have a use, we have two different types of user roles here. The first one is the system administrator. The second is tracker data entry. So the system administrator has been granted uh, the permission all, meaning he has full access or, or um, authorities to do anything within the DHS2 instance. Whereas this tracker data entry user role, we are only giving some limited uh, uh, permissions or authorities, right? So for example, he can see tracker capture application, he can update track entity entities, uh, and then he can uncomplete events, and he can also search track entity instances across the organization unit. So here for this particular user, the tracker data entry user, we are only giving four permissions, right? As per this diagram, so it's a kind of very limited uh, uh, amount of access that this user is going to have. Right. Then next, uh, in, in the latter part of uh, today's session, we'll be discussing in detail about the concept called user groups. So DHS2 users can also be assigned to various user groups. User groups uh, are used to set up access and sharing of objects or notifications. So if you can remember the tracker programs that we created, the final step was to assign it to a user 
or use a group. So probably we did not like in our demonstration, we just assigned to one user, but you may, you may have also seen if you refer the documentation or if you just, uh, when you are assigning, you may have seen that you can assign uh, that uh, basically you can share that tracker program with the user group as well. So once it is shared with the user group, all of them will go, are going to have access. So this user groups, uh, basically a combination of user roles, user groups uh, is what constitutes what a user can do within the DHIS2 instance. So when we create a DHIS2 user, that user is going to get assigned a user role, which means there'll be uh, say a set of authorities that user role is assigned to. So all these tasks that user is able to do. And then if we assign that user to a user group, it will kind of um, uh, will determine what are the objects that this particular user is going to have access within the system. So it's a, always a combination of user groups and user roles that defines what the user can do and, and, and what, what is the kind of like, uh, I mean, what are the different objects? Say, for example, what programs that uh, user is going to have <clears throat> is determined by the user, uh, user group, right? So it's always a combination of these two concepts. Right, so for example, uh, you can see here, um, we have this user, Shurajit, who can be assigned to one or more than one user group. So here he can be assigned to a malaria user group, admin malaria group, right? And then we have another user group called uh, TB analysis, as well as TB, uh, HIV analysis. So this user can be uh, a member of each of these user group. So the implication is like whatever the sharings, like for example, if we shared uh, access to a, say the access to TB program, if we shared with the TB analysis user, uh, this user, uh, Surajit, is going to have access to that program, right? And at the same time, if uh, malaria is also shared with this group, he's going to have access to that. And the uh, and and if we have shared the HIV program with the H analysis HIV user group, this user, Surajit, is also going to have access to that program as well. So how he has access to all these three programs is because uh, he is a member of each of these user group, right? So that's how we determine, uh, we, I mean, what are the objects? It could be like, for example, program, a particular user is going to have access, right? So we will discuss in detail about how this user groups uh, concept is going to affect uh, uh, what the user can do uh, in the latter part of the day. Right, so then we will briefly discuss about uh, the organization units. So we have different, uh, I mean, types of organization units, right? So for example, we, we talk about data capture and maintenance organization units. So this kind of determines where a user can capture data, right? So when you are configuring a, when we are, when we are creating a user, we have to de determine, we have to define the data capture and maintenance org unit. So uh, uh, now, Again, it is going to be like a combination of like, say for example, now uh, when we are saying uh, uh, this determines where a user can capture data, he must be also part of user group with the setting data can, uh, can capture and view data. For example, if you can remember when we were uh, configuring the TB program, we defined uh, uh, in the last part, we had to set so that that particular uh, user can capture as well as view data. And also in the same time, uh, when we are talking about this data capture and maintenance organization unit, it determines what is the organization unit a user will see in the maintenance app, right? But uh, for that to happen, that particular user must have a user role which grants access to weave main maintenance app, right? So then again, you can understand like uh, you just can't, uh, you know, like uh, by, by assigning a user to a capture org unit, uh, will not give him access to the maintenance app. So it's a kind of a combination of the user role, which has the authority to weave the maintenance app and a user having access to one org unit that will kind of constitute the entire authority or the permission access that the user is going to have in the system. 
And then we also have a type of organization unit, uh, or what we are defining when we are creating a, a user called data output and analytic organization unit. So here it determines the level of uh, data a user can see based on the organization unit selected. And then we also have search organization unit concept. So this determines uh, what are the organization units a user can search for a track entity instance. So for example, even though a user may have access uh, to, to level three uh, uh, capture org unit and a weave org unit, uh, if that user, when we are configuring, if we configure the search uh, with a kind of a higher organization unit uh, level, say like level two, he'll be able to search all the track entity instances up to the up, up to that particular level, right? So it's it's again kind of overriding uh, uh, or kind of like setting a higher level of access when the uh, track when we are searching the track entity instance, right? So here we discuss about three different concepts associated with org unit. This one is the tracker uh, data, sorry, uh, the data capture and maintenance org unit. The second is data output and analytic org units, and third is search org units, right? Okay, and also it is uh, kind of important to notice that in all cases, a user will automatically be granted to all uh, access to all lower levels within the top most org unit selected. So for example, if we give access uh, to level two in the org unit hierarchy, that means, uh, under, I mean, whatever the org units coming under level three, under that level two org unit, he will have access, something like that, okay? Right. Um, for example, uh, now uh, this user, uh, Shurajit, we can just assign one org unit or more. For example, here, as you can see, the particular user has been assigned more than one org unit access. So he's uh, assigned access to province one, two, and three. So that way we can, I mean, in, in the organization unit three that we are uh, seeing when we are configuring the uh, user, we can give multiple level of, levels of access. Right. So here you are seeing a summary of uh, what we have discussed so far before we move to the demonstration. So uh, when we are uh, discussing about users in DHIS2, uh, a user is assigned to a user role. So a user role restricts what uh, apps a user can access and what operations a user can perform within those apps. Uh, and then we also assign users to, uh, to, uh, to organization unit. So this will restrict access to organization units within the data entry maintenance and maintenance analysis and searching. And then we can also assign the user to a user group, which restricts access to specific objects. Uh, and it also aids in notification separation, right? So this is kind of summary of what we have discussed so far. Right, so uh, next, what we are going to do is to uh, do a demo of uh, user roles. And followed by that, we will discuss about uh, user groups. <laughs> 